Okay, um, hello and uh, welcome to the uh, final session of the day. Um, we are, in a sense, the uh, redhead stepchild of the conference. Uh, we have 60 minutes rather than the 90 minutes that all the previous sessions had, but we'll pack a lot of quality into those uh, 60 minutes. Uh, I'm your moderator, Downis Hours, uh, Associate Professor at the University of uh, Latvia. Um, we have uh, an excellent panel today um, focusing on the EU's global role, which is, of course, a very uh, important question at the moment. Um, in June last year, the member states mandated the EU High Representative, Federica Mogherini, to create a new document to update the 2003 European Security Strategy which uh, Lolita Chigana already quoted quite extensively in the first session of the day this morning. This document was, of course, written at a very different time uh, in a very different European Union, and it does need to be updated. Um, the new global strategy will be presented later on this year. I believe June is the deadline. And I hope that in this session we can draw, address two broad themes dealing with the European uh, global strategy. The first is to consider what are the important, what are the salient challenges that the European Union faces, not just in the short term, not just the issues which have been discussed already quite extensively throughout the conference, but we should perhaps be looking forward in to the medium term and perhaps into the longer term to think about what are the potential challenges we face around 2030 or around 2025, and not just consider what's on the agenda today. The second thing is to consider how the European Union should react to these potential challenges, to these potential threats we face, um, to discuss the instruments that we can adopt, the policies that we can adopt, what we can do to strengthen um, the EU's external dimension. Um, to deal with these issues, then, we have a uh, sterling uh, panel. I'll just quickly run through our panelists before they start speaking. Our first speaker will be Sandra Kalnieta, um, one of Latvia's most experienced diplomats, a former foreign minister, uh, uh, a widely published author in multiple languages, um, and now a, a member of the European uh, Parliament who usefully, uh, for the purposes of this session, is also the rapporteur on the global strategy for foreign and security policy. We also have uh, to my right Ian Anthony um, from the Stockholm International Peace Research in Institute who is a widely published security expert with an alarmingly large number of uh, publications dealing with uh, nuclear threats and uh, nuclear uh, uh, policy. Um, then we have uh, Peter Sustubs, again an experienced Latvian diplomat who recently has been based at the European Commission Chief of Staff to uh, Commissioner Pierbalks and now working uh, with Federica Mogherini in the European External Action Service. And finally, to my extreme left, uh, a very good friend of mine, a multiple co-author of mine as well, Andres Kassekamp, uh, an Estonian foreign policy expert and professor of Baltic politics at Tartu University. So welcome to the panelists. And we'll stick with the schedule in the program, so uh, we'll begin with uh, Sandra Kalnieta, and each speaker has approximately eight minutes at their disposal. So, Ms. Kalnieta. Uh, thank you very much for this generous introduction, and I would ask you to put on ha headphones, because I think in, in, in my national parliament, it is my obligation to speak in Latvian. And this I will do. Uh, let me first of all thank the members of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament who entrusted me with the responsibility of drafting a report on the EU's external and global security policy. A bit about the time line for uh, this policy. Tomorrow is an important day because tomorrow for the first time my draft report will be debated in the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, then different comments will be provided, Mark 
markups will be provided, and hopefully in April will be adopted uh, by the European Parliament in its plenary sitting. So the timeline is sort of designed to make sure that the High Representative Federica Mogherini would have, you know, enough material to uh, formulate the global uh, strategy. So why does the EU need a new global strategy? Well, firstly, most of the threats that were identified back in 2003 are still relevant. However, on top of that, we are now facing additional threats and challenges, and we need to face those. We need to be resilient to uh, cyber security, cyber weapons, um, uh, migration, hybrid uh, threats, hybrid warfare, revisionist powers that are trying to move the borders by force and that are violating or breaking the existing treaties and laws and that are going against the world order that was shaped as a result of very difficult international agreements is something that we are facing at the moment. Economic changes, military power, demographics uh, have also shifted uh, the balance uh, and uh, even more uh, so, uh, for Europe, the U.S. is sort of shifting its focus towards Pacific and Asian region, away from Europe. So, there is one important lesson that we can learn from all of the above. So, at the moment, we are in a phase where we are fully aware uh, that the cooperation, age of cooperation that began with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union is now over. We are entering the age of competition now. And the EU must be fully aware, must recognize that it has to be an equal partner uh, able to compete at the global the scale. A bit about the sort of limitations or the impediments for the successful sort of restructuring of Europe in the new global circumstances. And let me highlight three reasons for the uh, restructuring. One of the key reasons is the lack of political will. Uh, the European Union is at the moment unable to function as a union. It is unable to use uh, the full arsenal of foreign sort of instruments at its disposal. That's probably one of the major weaknesses of the EU. And lack of coordination between the external and internal policy is another of its weaknesses. And uh, inability of the EU to act consistently is another reason for uh, the uh, repositioning, uh, need for repositioning of Europe. And there's one more topic that sort of we uh, kept quiet about is insufficient foreign spending, insufficient foreign uh, spending, insufficient synergy and cooperation in uh, military procurements. So what sort of global strategy do we need for us to gain credibility at the global level? We need to be able to show that we are able to solve the problems in our neighborhood, that we are able to work constructively with our neighbors. If we fail to do so, we will not be able to position ourselves as an equal partner at the global uh, scale. You know that EU strategic interests are defined by the Council and you might ask what is the role of the Parliament in you know, the whole process of defining those priorities and why should the Parliament uh, come up with this report. So basically the report contains recommendations that are sort of binding uh, to the Council because we represent uh, a big a majority of the European voters and I would like to now present to you the three priorities that the Parliament has defined. We need to protect the EU member states and societies and values. How many minutes do I have left? Four minutes. Okay. That's wonderful. Second priority of the Parliament is to ensure the stability in Europe's neighbourhood uh, and immediate and uh, more distant neighbourhood, Europe must work on a stronger, more cohesive 
uh, global position or the world order. Now let's talk about the first priority, defending or protecting the European Union uh, member states and uh, societies and people. Uh, first and foremost, we must make sure that our member states, our people and our neighbouring uh, countries are stable and resilient. So we are talking about resilience with, which has become a buzzword lately, you know, resilience. Uh, is one of the qualities that we need you know, from European perspective and we must make sure that the peace and security order is ensured in uh, Europe and we can't use only the soft power for that. We need to develop military might that is complementary to the NATO collective defence system or model that is able to engage in operations outside of the EU borders whenever needed. Now let me talk briefly about the priority number two, the stability in the Europe's neighbourhood. We need to continue enlarging the EU and must uh, accept those countries that, have, uh, that are willing to accede to the European Union and we must work primarily with those countries that would like to integrate in the European Union through association agreements. We must be able to prevent crises. We must have a sort of a, uh, a a plan, uh, an emergency plan we, for handling the crisis. We must also be able to mitigate the consequences of the crisis. We need to have plans for those and we must ensure that there is coherence between the internal and external policies and uh, that um, we have consistent policies in this regard. And thirdly, you know, a new world order based on the international law. Uh, that would mean integrated uh, global governance in trade, in climate change, cyberspace and politics and so on and so forth. And even more importantly, given the current circumstances, we must be able to manage those global refugee flows and fight uncontrolled migration and its causes primarily, and I will not dwell on that because we all know what is meant here. All the principles are there, nobody doubts them, everybody is in the clear So, as regards to what are the principles underpinning the strategy. We already have a plethora of instruments at our disposal, but we are not using them to the full extent we have bilateral instruments and multilateral instruments available to us. Now, as regards the value added brought in by the Parliament, so our value added that we would like to give is the five-year uh, review process and uh, the uh, strategy should uh, cover at least a decade uh, and the Parliament should also be monitoring or exercising the scrutiny of this, uh, over the implementation of this strategy and the High Representative should report on the delivery uh, every five years. We would like to have a bigger role in reviewing the strategy and last but not least we would like to see a better communication with the EU citizens. I hope that this rather quick insight uh, is you know, nevertheless sufficient for you to engage in a proper discussion on these issues. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mrs. Kalni. I have one quick question about uh, expansion of the EU. What would be the countries that you see as potential new member states and where would be the future border of the EU? Well, this is a very provocative question because it is not I alone that decides such things. We are currently in negotiations with uh, Turkey, which is a candidate country. We are in negotiations with Serbia. We are very close to opening negotiations with Macedonia, if I'm not mistaken. I perhaps uh, forgotten some one, but uh, there is also a whole range of countries that are within the preparation phase to become a candidate country. Thank you. Uh, that was the view from the European Parliament. And now we uh, switch across uh, Brussels uh, towards uh, the European Commission and uh, Peter Sustobs, who, as I already said, is part of Federica Mogherini's team at the European External Action Service. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, first of all, uh, for inviting to the conference. And I'm looking forward, first of all, to hear my, my um, colleagues 
from right and left on, on such an interesting issue uh, concerning the global role of the EU. And um, I think the debate on the EU's global role um, is not new one. We know that actually several strategies are already adopted uh, 10 years ago and we had uh, extensive debates on them. But uh, this time around, it is very crucial to have this debate as uh, politics require to come back to the issue of the global role of the EU again and again. As over time, the priorities, um, alliances, political poles uh, across the globe um, and different kind of um, challenges are shifting and therefore there is a need and evidence for the EU global role uh, to be redefined, looked again, and specifically because of three aspects. First of all, it is not given this role as the global role uh, for the EU. It is not free of charge and at the same time not accepted by all. Um, therefore, the EU should not only declare its global role, but should also um, uh, carefully consider, consider how to prove it. And for today's debate, I would like to, to propose um, five elements um, where the EU should invest to maintain its global role. And first of all, um, not surprisingly, the global role starts at home. And in times we are living, the EU is overwhelmed uh, with its internal politics. It ranges from stability of the euro area, uh, safeguard of the union itself, um, it is migration issues as well as the internal security. And many decisions the EU uh, has taken, um, let's say, over several decades at very sunny and prosperous and luxury times, um, today are tested in rather stormy weather. And therefore, um, the list of potential homeworks the EU needs to do and concentrate is rather long and all of those issues are actually quite urgent and important to address um, and there is no uh, any other way than to, to spare no time and energy for, for that to be resolved. But if the EU will, will um, uh, manage its homeworks, um, it will bring also and secure the prominence at the global level. Therefore, the homeworks are, are the, the, the initial, initial, uh, home, initial elements to be um, kept high on the agenda. Second, I think the guiding principle for the EU um, should be care about your neighbor or neighborhood as for yourself. Um, and it is difficult for the EU to play a truly global role if neighborhood from south to east uh, is not stable in terms of the security, economical growth, uh, as well as prosperity. And at the same time, this stability uh, in the neighborhood comes at certain cost, with a certain responsibility and with sacrifices. So EU should uh, definitely listen to member states and understand the neighbors in order to, to move forward uh, this, this agenda. Third, um, every global player needs to know a clear set of rules. Uh, and rules today are not the same as they used to be. Um, in fact, the world is currently in a very fragile imbalance. And um, the good old Bretton Woods system is more and more challenged as emerging powers are putting in place um, alternative structures for global governance like uh, a new development bank, like Asia infrastructure investment bank, like uh, contingent reserve arrangements, um, some kind of alternatives to uh, IMF and the World Bank and all kind of regional development banks. And competition is building up for um, existing global governance uh, frameworks and at some point might come up with a new rule book. And therefore it is quite important that in given circumstances when old is challenged 
um, but the alternative is not yet fully functional. The EU should pay due attention to those developments and secure the global lead in this process. Fourth, uh, to secure that the EU grasps all opportunities what one particular new generation trade agreement will bring. Many debates in Europe um, are taking place about pro and cons uh, of the open and global trade. A lot of voices are in favor of more protective trade rules and many are advocating against TTIP. But in reality, hesitating or advocating against TTIP uh, means that we put in doubt the prospects of next generation global role for the EU as TTIP um, would lead us towards the first ever cross-continental integration with rules of uh, cross-border investments, competition, procurement rules and policies, intellectual rights, services and regulatory framework. And no doubt that TTIP would secure the global stage for the EU, uh, new uh, global stage, and this is the opportunity not to be missed. And last, fifth, um, the Internet. The Internet has already became by far the most important piece of infrastructure in the global economy, but uh, this is still just the beginning. Uh, within next five to ten years, um, the Internet um, will be probably the most important infrastructure of all infrastructures, as uh, all other important um, lifelines of the economies will be linked in one or the other way specifically to, uh, to the Internet, ranging from trade, financial services, um, shipping, energy, maritime security, or even foreign policy and uh, global outreach. Uh, therefore, acknowledging the dynamics of uh, those developments um, should lead to quite a significant package of decisions and actions uh, to properly manage the Internet as it will and it is the synonym for security against long list of the hybrid threats and those are the hybrid threats we need to address also in the framework of the EU global role. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. So I, I have a small follow-up question for you as well. You mentioned uh, the TTIP as the uh, uh, fourth element in the global role. And I don't think there's any doubt that uh, uh, furthering trade amongst uh, states and continents and so on is something which leads to uh, economic growth and development and so on. But there is some concern that the benefits may be mixed amongst the different member states. So recently I read the uh, ECFR's evaluation of the impact of TTIP, the estimated impact of TTIP on the member states. And the most striking thing in a report was, as I recall, they numbered the benefits from 10, meaning fantastic benefits, to one minimum. And if I'm not mistaken, Estonia, it's always Estonia, Estonia was at the top, I think, with uh, 10 points uh, as, as having maximum benefit from the TTIP, but Latvia was, I think, 26th of 28 states um, with just one or two points. So um, how do you deal with these concerns that TTIP might be great for Germany, great for the UK, but perhaps less beneficial to the uh, countries on the periphery of uh, Europe? If we make the reference to the same research, and I think it is, uh, the, the uh, Baltic state who will benefit the most from, from the TTIP would be Lithuania. And un unfortunately, Latvia and Estonia would be uh, somehow sliding back in a second, second uh, row. Um, and somehow, surprisingly, it describes the, the reality that uh, the economical relations between Latvia and in general Baltic states are not really uh, close enough with the United States but at the same time it should not be excuse to say we don't need TTIP. Um, and there are reasons why why probably this evaluation is as it is uh, because if you would look at the economical players either in Germany or in Italy or in France or Spain, those might be the big uh, companies who immediately might bring huge economical benefits because the employments and exchanges will be high. 
um, for European standards, I think largest part of the Latvian enterprises would almost immediately fall into the category small enterprises or small and medium enterprises. Therefore, it is a huge work to be done internally in order to promote, first of all, potential opportunities to deal with, uh, with uh, or, or trade with the United States. And secondly, um, what is the idea of the TTIP? The TTIP's idea is that this is not the agreement just for big companies, this is not just for multinationals, but rather to bring on board all possible players, including small and medium-sized enterprises. And for that, actually, this is the good platform also for Latvia to consider what we can do and what, how we are going to benefit in the market, which is the United States. And I think for that, in general, we don't need to wait when the TTIP will happen. Actually, the outreach and the activities in the United States from the Latvian side reach out to, to uh, trade opportunities in Washington uh, should be supported already now in order, once the TTIP comes, we are ready to benefit from that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. And now we'll hand over from the, uh, from the more political side over to the uh, research and think tank environment, uh, beginning with uh, Ian Anthony, the uh, director of CIPRI's European Security Programme. Well, thank you very much, and um, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this meeting, and particularly thanks to them for the title of the session, um, The Global Role of the EU, uh, which I would like to differentiate from the issue of a global strategy for external action, which I think is something else. And I think the global role is a more useful and more productive way of looking at the issues because I will argue that there are some deeper and more systemic fundamental issues at play which affect the internal dynamics of the EU as much as they affect the global picture. Um, that the distinction between what's internal and what's external, particularly in the field I'm interested in, in security, has been artificial for a long time and is increasingly artificial. And that although the most fundamental question, I think, for the EU is how to connect these internal and external issues in a coherent way, we're actually very bad at it. Uh, in 2015, we produced a document, an internal security strategy, before we even began to uh, elaborate an external security strategy when it's obvious that these two things should have taken place simultaneously and led to one document. Um, I think it could illustrate this uh, with a couple of examples. You could pick many, but a couple that I think are particularly interesting. Uh, one is the question of how can governments meet the expectations of their people. This is something that's actually been discussed quite a lot during the course of today. Uh, what's the evolving role of the state uh, in thinking about that question? And the second is how to build a new international financial system. And I think a couple of words on each uh, are, are interesting in illustrating the global role. Uh, so if we start with this question of the changing role of the state and the expectations of populations, in the um, short text which accompanies the introduction to this, uh, this panel, Ukraine and Syria are mentioned, and of course these are very extreme examples where states were unable to meet the expectations of their people and have been heavily criticized for that. Uh, it's quite right to say that Russia has exploited um, the situation through an opportunistic um, and selfish use of force. But Ukraine is a country of well over 40 million people. And if the government of Ukraine had spent the last two decades building a successful and modern state, they would have been well capable of resisting this using their own resources. Uh, if Bashar al-Assad had used the decade after his father's death to modernize Syria as a state, it wouldn't have unraveled within three months from a small demonstration in a regional city to a civil war which has devastated the country and uh, led to very fundamental and serious repercussions for the region, and in fact, internationally. So we criticize very heavily countries like Ukraine and Syria, but countries inside the EU, to a lesser extent, uh, meet the same challenges. Um, again, we can produce examples. If you look at the period after 2010, uh, we've had massive public manifestations in Southeast Europe 
uh, of discontent of the public with their, with their governments. Now that's happened certainly in Bosnia, in Macedonia, in Moldova, in Serbia, outside the EU. But we've seen equally large, even larger manifestations in Greece, in Bulgaria, in Romania. Um, in Spain, we have the situation in Catalonia, where again the government has proved unable to meet the aspirations of a very large part of its population. And we have an unfolding constitutional crisis which the EU is at some point going to have to confront. Now these problems were recognized already in the 2003 security strategy. Um, the problem of state failure was attributed to bad governance. Um, that bad governance corrodes states from within, ultimately perhaps leading to state failure which undermines global governance and adds to regional stability. The remedies that we came up with at that time have all proved unsatisfactory. A combination of uh, regime change, strengthening weak states and rebuilding failed states has not delivered. And the EU should be able to drive forward um, a movement from a state-centric approach to a more systemic approach to managing problems. Um, but it can't engage on that while it has difficulty even talking about questions like the future of Spain in the context of Catalonia. Um, the EU obviously has a stake in the global financial system. Uh, now that has a big internal dimension, recovering trust in a compromised system. Um, but it clearly also has an external dimension, accommodating emerging players in a global system that wasn't designed for their benefit and which they resent. Uh, exploiting the promise of new markets um, and financial inclusion the billions of people in Africa, Middle East and Asia who are outside the financial system. Uh, it's an economic opportunity that European companies would certainly want to participate in, but it also reads across to our security policy. These are countries where you have very young populations who see no future. If they were able to participate in the financial system, build capital, um, create a meaningful life for themselves and their families, it would change their outlook and it would improve our security. Um, so again, what are the perspectives here? If rules in regional and emerging markets are set elsewhere, EU companies may not be able to compete successfully for new business. If EU regulations related to anti-money laundering and sanctions uh, promote a risk-averse approach in private companies, then the available business may go to companies elsewhere. If digital standards are too weak, then cybercrime will expand and consumer confidence will suffer. And if the wrong governments design legislation and set standards, the global financial system will actually become an instrument for repression and authoritarianism. So as we move towards creating our own digital systems inside Europe, we have to have a global perspective. Um, I hope these two examples make a a compelling case that the EU has to think about its global role more in terms of how we discuss fundamental systemic issues uh, instead of separating internal and external action. And I think it really also demonstrates the need to recover a perspective which has been lost as emphasis is now placed on national sovereignty uh, in a way that seems to me at least to be at odds with reality. Um, the belief that we can solve our problems more effectively together than any of us can alone, was the basis for cooperative security in Europe after 1990. And it was a recipe for success. This period where we used cooperative security as our organizing principle made us more prosperous, uh, more secure, and, uh, and more self-confident. And until we can get back to that, uh, it seems to me that we're going to um, make less than the, the sum of our parts, if you like, when we think about a global role for the European Union. Thank you, uh, Ian. I have a sort of, let's say, a down-to-earth question. Mm, so if we, if we have this uh, cooperative security, a return to cooperative security, how could we handle one of the challenges which you outlined um, of dealing with failed states or anocracies, um, as you know, political scientists call them? Um, they're growing in number, growing in scope. How would a return to, to, to what you suggest help us deal with this challenge? Well, as I said, um, we have to move to a situation where we don't 
take state-centric approaches to resolving these problems. We have to move to a more systemic approach where the state understands that it's one actor among many in bringing about the conditions that the citizens need to create a satisfying life um, and a positive future. So we have to promote systemic solutions that engage the private sector, that engage uh, international as well as national organizations, um, that extend beyond uh, officials into uh, other realms of public life, whether it's the media, whether it's academia, whether it's the civil society and political organizations. We have to move to a systemic approach from an approach which puts all of the responsibility on states to solve problems. We demonstrated in the last 10 years that states don't know how to do this anymore in such a complex environment. Okay, thank you. Now, before we switch to Andres Kessekamp, um, uh, Sandra Kalnieta will be leaving us in um, 10 short minutes. Uh, unfortunately, she has to run off at 10 to 5. So, in the event that there are any questions from the audience which are specifically uh, meant for uh, Ms. Kalnieta's um, uh, talk, perhaps you could ask these questions now, and then we'll move on to our uh, Estonian friend, Andres Kessekamp. Yeah, Andres. Andres Kovinch, European Movement in Latvia. I was extremely happy to hear the communication dimension in your presentation at the end in this importance in foreign affairs. Could you elaborate a little bit on that and saying what does this mean to foreign affairs in Latvia and its communication here in our country? Thank you. I should say that communication always is important and uh, one of the, the weakest points of European Union is how to sell any of our policies to European citizens. Uh, worst of all, of course, are external and security dimensions. Uh, however, in the current situation, then we are aware about the dangers around the, the ultimate borders of European Union. I think that the interest for external action is growing. It's up to those who are our diplomats and politicians to give clear answers and explanations where are not yet solutions found, but at least that Europeans can follow. Uh, what is uh, the direction of our actions and reflections. Any other questions? Well, if not, then we'll uh, take a hop, a skip and a jump uh, northwards uh, towards Estonia and uh, uh, Andres Kesikem from the University of Tartu. Thank you, Daunis. Um, I find myself in the unenviable position of being the final speaker in the final session of the final moments of this conference and everything has already been said, but not yet by me. So I shall try not to repeat too much, but that's uh, uh, probably unavoidable. Uh, first of all, since this conference was conceived partly to evaluate the uh, Latvian presidency and its consequences, then let me say that all of the Estonian officials who I've talked to over the past year have all been very positive about the way Latvia ran the, the presidency. I haven't actually heard a single negative word from my Estonian colleagues. Uh, so uh, I think that in order to praise uh, Latvia's job in Estonia will be the final, the last uh, Baltic state to finally hold the presidency and you've set a very high standard uh, for us to follow and it'll be particularly um, a difficult job because it's in conjunction in 2018 with the 100th anniversary of our independence and your independence as well so it'll be a particularly uh, festive and important event in fact the EU presidency might in Estonia be overshadowed by the uh, independence celebrations. So in this short presentation I'll first uh, describe the situation we're in at the moment in terms of EU in, uh, as a global actor and then come to some prescriptions. Um, first of all, looking back at the uh, strategy written in 2003, there was the memorable line by Robert Cooper about the EU being a 
surrounded by a ring of friends, which now has turned into a ring of fire uh, in the neighborhood. There was optimism in 2003. The EU was then the shining example for the rest of the world. Um, think of the African Union potentially emulating uh, the EU, um, the Asians trying to form some sort of cooperative uh, institutions. They're far from that. Uh, but the EU has suffered a great loss of confidence, um, as Ian Begg uh, this morning brilliantly outlined with the uh, analogy to uh, suffering, how to deal with grief and depression that the EU has uh, fallen into. Um, and climbing out of that uh, is difficult because our publics need to be convinced of the added value of the European Union, particularly in foreign and security affairs. Um, the optimist often used to quote the fact that um, amongst the EU policies which had public support, uh, foreign and security policy was, was the one that was uh, constantly uh, favored by, by a majority as opposed to all sorts of other policies. But I'm afraid that the, the uh, EU citizens really have very little time or interest to dwell on uh, larger issues of foreign and security policy and particularly strategy. We've fallen into a cycle of, of populism um, where, which can impinge also on foreign policy. I think one of the dangerous, um, dangerous examples that we will shortly see is uh, the Netherlands, which is going to be holding a referendum on Ukraine's association agreement. And we can see how this can sort of derail potentially uh, the work of our diplomats and how it also opens up the opportunity if there's a sort of public movement which initiates a referendum that could possibly be manipulated from by, say, outside powers. Um, and populism is affecting us as well. For years I've been writing about, uh, together also with Downis, uh, populism uh, and the extreme right here, and I was always explaining why the extreme right had failed in Estonia, and now, sadly, I have to report that Estonia has joined the trend, and we have the uh, extreme right populace who are using the issue of refugees um, to increase their popularity, and I'm, and I'm quite convinced that they will be improving their position, so Estonia has joined that trend. And ironically, of course, all this began with uh, the European Union trying to fix its democratic deficit. Now, the whole business with the Constitutional Treaty and the Convention on the Future of Europe before we joined uh, the European Union back in 2003 all began with this desire to come closer to the citizens. And that ended up paradoxically with asking their opinion and as political scientists know when, when citizens are asked their opinion in a referendum they don't often answer the direct question but use the opportunity to express their displeasure at their government's uh, policies. And also, I would lump this in with the, the populism, is a link to, to foreign affairs, is the uh, looming Brexit. Um, minus the UK, uh, the EU as a global actor will be severely weakened. Um, this is of great importance for us. Uh, I understand that, that most of us expect that next week at the summit, or this week already, there will be an agreement perhaps with the UK. Reaching the agreement, I think, will be the simple part. Cameron will then have to turn around and convince his public that the deal is really something that is groundbreaking, changes the UK's relationship, which if that was the case, then they wouldn't be reaching the deal so easily, would they? Um, so these are worrying signs, that's the state of play at the moment, and now for the, in the few moments that I have left, uh, the, the recommendations. Well, first of all, of course, if we put it in the framework of a document, the first remark would be, of course, that member states' interests are simply too diverse to place in one uh, strategy document. Um, but I would have sort of three things that I would like to emphasize in this document amongst 
many others. The first, of course, which is natural to anyone from the Baltic states is to strengthen the transatlantic uh, relationship, transatlantic ties. Um, Peter has already mentioned the importance of, of TTIP. He mentioned the economic uh, benefits. Well, it, it, it is true that a country like Estonia or Latvia perhaps won't be benefiting directly economically from this very much, but that's not why it's important for us. It's the political meaning, uh, connecting and deepening this linkage between North America and the, Europe is all important for us. Because if we look at the larger picture, the liberal world order is under threat. Um, China is the rising power. The US is pivoting to Asia. It's being mired in the Middle East, so Obama really hasn't managed to pull his, to put his pivot into Asia, to Asia in full effect. But it's undoubtedly a long-term trend in the US policy, no matter who is the president. So connecting anchoring the EU and America uh, together is a top priority, uh, a political priority, and of course with uneven economic benefits, but I'm sure the benefits will outweigh uh, the negatives for us as well. And of course within, the, within this transatlantic relationship then there's NATO and the EU, which uh, have their headquarters in the same city in Brussels but uh, aren't very good at talking to each other. Um, those two organizations need to function more closely together in our interest. It's only rational and logical. And of course, one of the preconditions for this, which we should be working for, is within our own union, is uh, trying to get a solution to uh, the Cyprus uh, question, which of course is the, the root cause which is blocking uh, closer NATO and EU cooperation. Second point is that we need, following up on the NATO and the EU business, generally of the EU's foreign, foreign policy instruments and policies, they need to be more joined up. I'm not going to go through the list of that because my time's coming to an end, but just one example would be uh, common foreign security policy, trade policy, development and cooperation, development cooperation and humanitarian policy all together. Well, what's the best thing we could do for our friends in Africa uh, would be uh, to reform the EU's common agricultural policy. We can pour as much money into development and try to use other foreign policy instruments, but the one thing, it's not a magic wand, but it would obviously have much greater impact uh, than, than anything else. And these two things seem to be divorced, that the left hand doesn't seem to be know, knowing what the right hand is doing within the EU itself. So simply joining up these various strands of department, departmentalized policy within the EU would bring sort of great future benefit. And my final point is the shortest one, is that we should be strengthening some of the EU institutions that deal with foreign policy, first and foremost the External Action Service. So I would strengthen uh, Petrus's role here uh, because I think the External Action Service, the EU's own foreign uh, service, uh, would particularly be beneficial for small states like Estonia and Latvia, who aren't glo don't have a global reach. So, thank you, Chairman. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Andres. Now, as uh, uh, time is moving on, we have a little over uh, 10 minutes uh, left in this session, I'd like to open the floor to uh, questions or comments or replicas uh, from the audience. And over here first. Mm, hi. Um, I think the Syrian crisis is one of the biggest tests to EU's legitimacy as a global foreign policy force. And as the years go on, it seems there seems to be no end in Assad announcing that he's uh, going to take back the whole country. So my question is, we have we have a regime which has killed most of its civilians. Most civilian casualties come from the government side. And we have a barbaric force, which is ISIS, um, which also, and it seems the EU has to back a regime which it has foreign, uh, formerly opposed. So where do, what can the EU do? Or e is there even a solution in such a 
mess of a situation? Well, uh, there's a nice and easy question uh, to, uh, for our panelists. Um, who'd like to take a crack at answering it? Uh, Peteps, maybe, from the uh, External Action Service perspective? Um, thank you very much. And as, as Dawn has said, that's the uh, probably most easiest question to, to, to answer. Um, I think there is no um, one single answer and no one single approach. But at the same time, um, I think what, what the EU's position at the moment is and what we are trying to achieve is that we give the prominence and the chance for the UN political process to move forward. Um, it is not about uh, backing one side or backing the other one or, or changing the position, but rather than to agree on the principles which were discussed just a few days ago in, in uh, Munich, first of all, once again, re-engage in political dialogue. And political talks between all involved should start. And of course, it relates also with the humanitarian situation to, <clears throat> to allow humanitarian convoys start to flee to the cities which are really in very devastating situation. But um, without this first step that actually all parties inside Syria and the parties outside Syria would agree to hold political consultations to resolve the conflict, um, this situation can't move forward. And this is the keystone for, for the European foreign policy at the moment. Although uh, probably from the outside the, uh, the uh, thinking and perception is that the EU is not actively involved. EU is very actively involved behind the scenes talking to all partners, again, inside and outside Syria, to make sure that we have the chance of holding credible peace talks under the UN auspices. Because in the current scale of the crisis, there is no other way than put this perspective within the UN. Thank you. Thank you, Peters. Uh, Ian? Yes, thank you. Um, I think there are some things which could be, which could be usefully done. Um, one is to do whatever is possible to correct the narrative of, of Syria as a country which is uh, in a permanent state of crisis because of internal divisions. Um, I think this is not a correct picture really of how Syria has developed as a country and is as a country. Um, and I think it's a, it's a narrative which plays into the hands of those people who want to divide for their own narrow and selfish purposes. So I think to try to get a more accurate picture out there into the public, uh, as well as into international processes of those constructive people inside Syria who want to build a better country, build a better future for themselves, would be a, a practical contribution that the EU could support. Um, a second thing which obviously needs to be done, I think, is to um, link up with those people that I mentioned, which are, I'm sure, the vast majority of Syrian people, um, who essentially want to get back to the business of, of normalcy um, and help in whatever ways we can, or at least not hinder. Um, and I think there are some problems which have been created. Um, to give an example, there are a lot of people who are trying to support the development of grassroots movements who are simply unable to transfer money into Syria because they either are refused a bank account, they can't use a financial transfer system because the banks are worried about being caught in enforcement actions related to sanctions, or have simply taken a decision that it's too risky to involve themselves in any transaction involving Syria. And that's a situation we've created through our instrumental use of sanctions. I'm not saying that sanctions are not an important instrument, but I do think we need to revisit the way in which we use them uh, to try to facilitate constructive types of engagement with the people in Syria who want to participate in building a better future. Um, so I think there are some practical things we could do which would help. Of course, we don't have a silver bullet uh, which is going to, to solve this problem. 
Um, but, but I think there are things we could do usefully. Thank you very much, Ian. And uh, Andres? I don't think the EU has much potential influence or role. I and mean, it's obvious the bigger role here is the US and, of course, Russia, which is propping up, not just propping up the regime, but engaging in most of the slaughter at the moment. So the US and Russia talking to each other, and of course, Iran and, and, and the Saudis. Um, another point here is, I think, uh, it's not through the EU that Latvia and Estonia might get involved in all this, but uh, through, through NATO, because we imagine usually that a conflict could erupt in the Baltic Sea region, and we doubt whether our allies in NATO would come to support us against Russia. But I think we might be in the, another situation first of our NATO ally Turkey needing our assistance soon being in conflict with Russia. Thanks. Um, again, open up the floor to questions, comments. Um, I have a slightly small comment regarding the uh, position of the European Union in, on the international scene. First of all, the current crisis show that um, the European Union, or at least uh, this crisis, created an impression that the European Union is like a, a besieged fortress, that everybody is hitting in the European values, and not only uh, by humanitarian uh, consequences, but also by uh, classic threats like uh, uh, war. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, the situation, the current situation which uh, uh, the European Union is in the moment, is this a consequence of the fact that the European Union didn't uh, assess a global role and it was waiting for what? This is my question. The fact that the European Union didn't do certain steps in order to become a global power. For example, I refer here to this plan of creating a common army. Thank you. Okay. Uh, was it addressed to anybody in particular on the panel or the panel as a whole? The, the panel as a whole. Okay, uh, Peters? Um, if as the entry point for, for for the answer of this question, we take the, um, uh, the security strategy the EU drafted of 2003, then theoretically we can say that the situation was so stable and so marvelous that the EU uh, thought that we don't need, we know, we don't need to, to proceed with, um, with some kind of uh, active, active engagement. Uh, because the situation looked very stable. Um, at the same time, as, as I mentioned, I think not only before 2003, but even after two, 2003, uh, quite many EU decisions were taken, uh, not probably fully grasping uh, what might come in terms of different kind of crisis. And uh, as you remember well, the first crisis uh, which hit the EU was actually a financial crisis. And uh, once reading the adopted decisions by the EU with the perspective um, of the crisis, it appears that actually different kind of arrangements were needed to be put in place to secure that the situation is by far more waterproof. Um, and I think the same could be applied also to the refugee crisis uh, we, we are facing, that several uh, decisions like Dublin mechanism and others uh, were taken when the situation was very stable and not always fully analyzing what if. And today the EU is living in, in the conditions if. Um, and, and the last comment would be that there will be definitely the consequence of this those consequent crises the EU is going through because I think the member states under the pressure of the uh, civil society and the citizens will, will look by far more carefully on every decision EU is taking. Can decisions be taken with the provisions that actually we prevent the crisis of the future? So uh, uh, there might be some kind of, of way forward which will secure us for, for better regulations and better decisions the EU will take. So we should 
learn the lessons of what, uh, what went wrong probably during the last couple of years of European integration. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I fully understood the question, but um, I, if it was related to whether the EU should aspire to be a global power, um, I have a view on that. Uh, I think it would be a mistake. Um, if the EU simply saw as its objective uh, becoming another player on the international scene which essentially mirrored the capacity of states, um, I think that would be resisted by the population. There's no evidence that people want that for all the reasons that the British colleagues explained earlier today. And um, the EU is, is uh, constructed differently. It's an, it's an innovation. It's not something which mirrors or parallels a state. Um, so I think it should be seen in that context rather than trying to develop something which is essentially a new great power. Um, and I think on, you know, the, the question of the European army is probably an illustration of that. We have a very effective framework for coordinating our military policies through NATO. We don't really need another one. Um, at the same time, the EU has a need for certain very specific types of military capability to support its external action. And these are things which, of course, should be developed. Um, so I think it's, 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 it's not uh, a realistic or in fact I think a useful project to see the EU as somehow a, an exercise to create a new great power. Uh, it's an innovation in governance and we should treat it that way. Okay, now uh, our time is running out so I think we have one more question from the audience unless anybody else has, has one. So this is the last question of the day. Make it a good one. Okay. Don't screw this up, all right? Uh, Arthur Zbikov, Riga Stradlich University, and I promise you I will make it a good one. Uh, so, we are talking about the EU global role, and it's important as for me to talk about its migration policy. And for me, it seems it doesn't, doesn't work well, does not work well today, and we're facing migrant crisis. And um, this is why I would like you to ask all, all, all panel members, shall we, for example, invest in media services or shall we financially support countries with uh, EU external borders? Because uh, as for me, it seems that countries with um, external borders, EU external borders, usually preserved uh, refugees and migrants as some kind of barbarians. Uh, and I'm fortunate to say that here, for instance, in Latvia, the support of the migrants are quite low. But I'm sitting here in place of Hassam Sabumeri, who I think is a good example of what integration actually can do. So maybe we should invest more money in media services that will show the, the um, right, um, I would say, the right position, the right role of the um, refugees as itself. They are not barbarians. Thank you. You mean media services targeted at EU citizens rather than... Yes, exactly. Okay, well, may maybe everybody could uh, briefly comment on this, although really it's more of a domestic issue than a, than a foreign policy one, but uh, I will give uh, Andres the uh, first word, uh, otherwise he's always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Um, well, giving more money to the media to, to, to properly disseminate information about uh, what is happening, um, I'm not sure that would work because the, the uh, political forces which are making the most noise and scaremongering about uh, the refugees and migrants um, tend to sort of have this mindset that the mainstream media is covering this up and, and lying to us. Anyway, they're not going to believe this and this would be sort of, well, confirming uh, their view that some sort of elite and establishment is trying to brainwash us. So I don't think an EU initiative on, on media is what would uh, uh, really, really help uh, in this case, unfortunately. Um, 
Well, I think we have to, this requires much longer time than we have, but we have to, as a first step, differentiate properly between different issues. And in your question and your comment, you moved freely between words like migration, refugee. These are not the same thing. Um, so first we need to try to promote in the public an understanding of what the issues are. Uh, migration is something which has always in the history of Europe been seen as a positive thing. Um, and a refugee is someone who's fleeing from a life-threatening situation. These are not the same thing at all. Uh, so I think a, a, a necessary first step is to try to get into the public discourse um, a bit more understanding of what it is exactly that we're talking about. It's very difficult, of course, in conditions where things have happened so fast and at such a large scale um, because you have this sense of emergency. Um, but I'm, I'm fully convinced that with a little bit of time and a little bit of perspective, people will realize that this is a purely artificially created crisis. The numbers are not intimidating in the context of a 17, 18 trillion euro economy. Um, the costs are not intimidating. Uh, with a bit more organization and a bit more structure, which will come with time, this too shall pass. Um, I do agree with my, my, my colleagues in the panel that um, whatever money might be pulled in into media, let's say, as such, will not change the, the, the situation uh, because of several factors. First of all, there is other type of media out there, and that's the social media. And I think uh, social media today is emanating the information by far more faster and by far more critical type of information than any other uh, type of media in, in the societies and member states might try to, to present. Secondly, um, I do agree that, again, linked with the social media, uh, there is not good stories coming out from the migration crisis. What we see in the media all over is just negative part of the migration. And even if there would be uh, small and slightest positive examples somewhere coming out from, from one or the other country in the European Union, uh, the wave of negativism would immediately swept away any, any of, of, of that. And last but not least, um, actually the discussions again in social media and then within the countries, including Latvia, is not always driven by the media. It is driven by the populism. And therefore, um, before some kind of bigger debate takes place, we need to address the other elements which were referred previously also by, by Anders, which is the populism and the misperceptions of, of the people in different parts of the EU. Thank you. Well, uh, to wrap up this session, in my uh, contribution to the uh, conference materials here, I did mention that uh, working on or discussing the global strategy um, at a time of rebuilding the ship at sea. In other words, trying to plan for the future at the time when there are severe external crises and also internal crises in the EU is quite challenging. And we seem to have fallen into this in this session as well, of rather than being forward-looking, of discussing more of the issues and the challenges that the EU faces um, immediately. Um, so I'd like to wrap up this session but I'll hand over now to um, the man who opened the conference early this morning and is still with us today. And this is the director of the Latvian Foreign Policy Institute, looking as chipper as ever, uh, Andris Vrutz, who will now give uh, us some closing remarks for the conference. Andris. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a long day. Uh, it's been a wide range of issues as well what we discussed today but i think it also shows what the european union is about it's about a wide range of issues and uh, the uh, challenges and opportunities what we face um, and i think all of us make our own conclusions what kind of stage we are and what we are dealing with and what are the most urgent crises what we heard today or at least we started uh, learning about the European Union in quite a gloomy terms. The year from the hell, and next year will be no better. The fight, fatal fragmentation and age of resentment, 
a lack of trust and lack of legitimacy, basically titanic. But nobody is perfect. Uh, if you look around the uh, global scene, Russia, is it perfect? China, Brazil, the so-called BRIC, promising BRIC countries. The U.S., of course, economically is doing quite okay, but politically it's becoming more and more interesting by day. Um, so the EU is, of course, partly a contraption. Not everything is working perfectly well. The EU is also incremental power, at least I love this term, that it does things slowly, but it does quite fundamentally. Not always it, it, it is able to react immediately. It's still a shining city on the whole, it was mentioned here, and I still would uh, use this uh, comparison. Still are nations which are willing to join the EU. If it's such a problematic situation, why they would be willing to join? There are people who are flowing in millions to be on the soil of the European Union. So uh, there are a lot of attractions. That's why let's avoid, I think it was also reminded here, let's avoid self-defeating logic and self-bashing that we are, we are wrong in everything what we are doing. I think we uh, can be proud of many things what we have achieved. As it was mentioned, the EU is work in progress. And of course, many things must, must, be, must be still achieved. And there is no silver bullet as well. So some of those uh, things to achieve, expectation management, I think it might be important that sometimes we expect soon, shortly, and immediately, and that we act very efficiently. I think 28 countries finding it difficult to do in this way. Of course, resilience was mentioned, and it starts with economic growth, and it's good that we are having some modest economic growth. But of course, it's not just about economy. So leadership is important on both national and EU level, even though sometimes I think there is some jealousy and, and collision of uh, interest in leadership. Investment, and not just financial investment, we mentioned as one of the success stories of the Latvia's EU presidency, Juncker Investment Plan, but it's not just about financial investment, it's about investment in innovation, education, in communication. So it's more about actually investing uh, ownership into the European project. As one of the German uh, colleagues told me, you know, we can make good uh, BMWs, Mercedes-Benz, there are some other cars, basically, but we cannot produce, unfortunately, uh, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg. Of course, this is a challenge, it's innovation and creativity, what we need more, and that's why perhaps cutting the red tape, the cutting the bureaucracy, sometimes sluggish, uh, the institutional procedures would be important. And of course, we need a uh, discussion about these things. And I think this has been a long day, but it's an important long day. And we need Brits in this discussion. As we saw today, there was a good contribution, and uh, I think that we need a wide range of uh, positions as well. So with this, I am uh, very happy and honored to thank once more to our partners, very valuable partners, uh, Latvian Parliament for hosting us. It's not an everyday event in the Latvian Parliament. Thank you for some parla parliamentarians who even survived with us the whole day at this. Uh, congratulations. Um, uh, thank you to, to, thanks to the, the European Commission's representation for generous support, and not just financially, but also in terms of the being also the owners of the whole event in terms of the intellectual participation, I think making us to think in from different perspectives, I think it is very important. Also the European Parliament's information office. Uh, I would like to thank my own colleagues, uh, especially Carlis and Olafs, and also the number of interns who did a lot of great job in the process. It has been not an easy one. Um, it's an easy job for me here to stand here, but it's not always easy to organize things, so thank you. Uh, of course, I am thankful to the speakers, because without the speakers there would not be event. So for coming and joining us and exactly enriching and showing the, the wide EU debate. To participants uh, who stayed for these long hours and were able to participate. And uh, also for a few thousand who watch us, us on the stream, on the live. It is, the whole debate, it's not 
just about some institutions, the formal ones. It's about the citizens. It's about involvement of the citizens, that they should be uh, touched upon in a sense. Their hearts and minds must follow in this debate. So I think we did a quite a good job. Thank you for participating in this effort, and it should be continued with the snacks, wine, and coffee also outside. So thank you so much.